This video was produced by and for the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. Join us as we take a closer look at the anatomy, history, life cycle, and control of the infamous Great Lakes invader, the sea lamprey. Have you ever seen this unusual creature that I'm holding? Did you know that this toothy mouth is responsible for one of the worst ecological disasters in the Great Lakes? My name is Andrea and I work for the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. My colleagues Ross, Lauren, Jill and I will be talking today about the vampire fish of the Great Lakes, the sea lamprey. We'll get this one back in its tank before we tell you more. Sea lampreys are one of the most notorious invasive species in the Great Lakes. Why are they so bad? Sea lampreys are parasites. They are fish that drink the blood and bodily fluids of other fish. And unfortunately, sea lampreys target some of the most valuable fish in the Great Lakes, like lake trout, whitefish, walleye, and salmon. Even big fish like lake sturgeon and small fish like yellow perch are attacked by sea lampreys. The worst part of a sea lamprey is its mouth. A sea lamprey uses its mouth to suction on to the side of a fish, then digs in like a fish hook with 150 teeth and uses its razor sharp tongue to drill a hole through the side of the fish. Once the hole is made, out comes the blood and bodily fluids that the sea lamprey feeds on. And to keep it flowing, the sea lamprey secretes an enzyme that prevents the fish's blood from clotting, similar to how a leech feeds off its host. The fish is alive while the sea lamprey feasts off its blood and bodily fluids. This is what it looks like when a sea lamprey has attached to a fish. It would be like a parasite the size of a baseball bat attaching to your stomach and drinking your blood. If that happened to you, that would make for a pretty bad day. And to fish in the Great Lakes that are attacked by sea lamprey, it's almost certainly a death sentence. In some circumstances, if seven fish are attacked by a sea lamprey, only one would survive. In other words, six out of seven fish attacked by sea lamprey may die either directly due to blood loss or indirectly when infection sets into the wound that's left behind from the sea lamprey. When sea lampreys first invaded, they had plenty of Great Lakes fish to eat, abundant pristine spawning habitat, and few natural predators to keep their populations in check. It was a perfect storm that led to an explosion of sea lamprey populations and an invasion with catastrophic consequences. Each sea lamprey can kill up to 40 pounds or 18 kilograms of fish during its life. Before sea lamprey were controlled, there were about two and a half million sea lampreys swimming in the Great Lakes. With each sea lamprey killing up to 40 pounds of fish, that's 100 million pounds of fish that were dying every single year due to sea lampreys. That's why sea lampreys are considered one of the worst, if not the single worst invasive species in the Great Lakes and how they earned the nickname, the vampire fish of the Great Lakes. If you are a fish, sea lampreys are a living nightmare. Let's take a closer look at this monster from the deep. To keep a better grip on the sea lamprey, I'm going to put on a pair of gloves. Sea lamprey have a very slimy coating on their skin. Now it's useful to the sea lamprey because it keeps infections from setting into their skin. But when it comes to handling a sea lamprey, that slime layer makes it pretty tricky. These are adult sea lamprey that I have in the tank. They were caught in a trap last spring. And this is a sea lamprey at its full grown size. Can you believe such a strange creature exists? Sea lampreys are jawless fish. Their flexible mouths allow them to form a tight seal around most any surface. Sea lampreys are also cartilaginous like sharks, meaning they do not have bony rigid skeletons. Instead, their bodies are highly flexible. They swim in the water using that same S-shaped motion that snakes use on land. The holes on the side of their head are gill pores. The sea lamprey's gills, which are used to breathe, are located inside the gill pores. Though sea lamprey are best adapted at breathing in water, they can obtain some oxygen directly from the air, so this time outside the tank isn't hurting the sea lamprey right now. The eyes of a sea lamprey are located on either side of their head. With that positioning, sea lampreys can see almost all the way around their bodies. There's no sneaking up on a sea lamprey. One of the most interesting features of a sea lamprey is its nose. Can you see it? Sea lampreys have one nostril on the top of their head that looks like a tiny blowhole. Though small, that nostril leads to a nasal organ that's about two to three times the size of their brain. Sea lamprey are smelling creatures, like swimming noses, not thinking creatures. 
And here's one last look at that sea lamprey's mouth. It's one of the creepiest sights in the animal kingdom. Does it remind you of any movie monsters you have seen? Do you think a sea lamprey might want to attack you? Fortunately, sea lamprey only feed on fish, not people. Lucky for us, but bad for those fish. And now to tell you more about this devastating invasive species is my colleague Ross. Thanks, Andrea. I'm Ross, and I work with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. Let's continue the sea lamprey saga with the story of how this menace arrived in the Great Lakes. So where did sea lampreys come from? With their frightening toothy mouths, you might think that they're aliens from another planet. But actually, sea lampreys and their ancestors have been living on Earth for millions of years, far longer than any human and most animals that we know of today. When you look at a sea lamprey, you're looking at a living fossil. Sea lampreys and their lineage have been on Earth for over 360 million years. It's fascinating to think that when dinosaurs like T-Rex, Stegosaurus, and Triceratops were roaming the Earth, sea lampreys were swimming in the ocean. Sea lampreys were confined to their native range of the Atlantic Ocean until the mid-1800s when the people of the Great Lakes region began building shipping canals. The construction of the Erie Canal System allowed sea lampreys to invade Lake Ontario in the 1860s. Then, the widening and deepening of the Welland Canal allowed sea lampreys to bypass Niagara Falls and invade Lake Erie by 1921. The shipping canals proved a valuable function at the time. They brought goods and jobs to the coastal communities around the region. However, over the years, they also opened the door to many invasive species like sea lamprey, alewife, and zebra and quagga mussels, just to name a few. The combined ecological damage of all these invasions has been enormous. By the late 1930s, sea lampreys had invaded all of the Great Lakes, and as they invaded, they left a wake of destruction. Entire economies crumbled, and the way of life for the people of the Great Lakes region changed drastically. Many people, and even entire communities, depended on the commercial and recreational fishing at the time. Sea lampreys devastated large-bodied fish populations in the valuable fisheries that depended on them. Lake trout, which supported one of the dominant commercial fisheries at the time, were one of the hardest-hit species by the sea lamprey invasion. Eventually, lake trout were extirpated or eliminated from four out of the five Great Lakes. Lake Superior was the only lake where they remained because that was the last lake that the sea lampreys invaded, but also the first lake where sea lamprey control was used but more on that later. Without fish to catch, many people lost their livelihoods. There are stories of fishermen describing the sea lamprey invasion like a storm approaching over the horizon. As sea lampreys invaded each lake, one by one, a sense of impending doom loomed in the minds of fishermen and women who were powerless to stop the invasion and coming devastation. And now, for some historical perspective, courtesy of an oral history project conducted by Dr. Corey Brandt through the GLFC and University of Michigan Water Center. There's just lots of them. Every place you look, there's one hanging on a fish, you know. But nobody, nobody really knew what they were until after they hit, you know. Then everybody got educated in a hurry. I can remember my dad, I was only four, but I can still picture my dad sitting at the table telling us about the lamprey coming into the Great Lakes. And he kept telling us that it was going to be an evil thing. And he said, we have to do something to control this. Or he would remind us that no live lamprey would go back into the water if it came up in our nets. Though fishers may have felt powerless, they were not voiceless. In the mid-1900s, there was public outcry for the governments of the United States and Canada to come together to do something about the sea lamprey menace. For decades, the two governments had tried but failed to work together to create a cooperative fishery management plan, or a plan that would prevent overfishing and allow fishers far into the future to enjoy the Great Lakes fishery. But the sea lamprey invasion changed that. The threat posed by sea lamprey jolted the two nations to action, ultimately setting the Great Lakes on a path towards recovery. A treaty between Canada and the United States called the 1954 Convention on Great Lakes Fisheries led to the creation of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, an entity with the authority to develop and implement an integrated binational control program for the sea lamprey. Additionally, the U.S. Geological Survey's Hammond Bay Biological Station was established to conduct research on control methods for sea lamprey. But again, more on that later. The sea lamprey control program 
is one of the best aquatic invasive species control programs in the world. Sea lamprey populations have been reduced by 90% compared to their historic highs of the 1950s and 1960s. What was once one of the worst ecological disasters has now become one of the greatest success stories of multi-jurisdictional invasive species control worldwide. My colleague Warren is now going to tell you about the Great Lakes Fishery Commission's control program and how the discovery of the sea lamprey life cycle was the gateway to developing successful control methods. Thanks, Ross. I'm Lauren, and I also work with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. So now that you've learned about the anatomy of sea lampreys and how they invaded the Great Lakes, I'm going to talk to you about their life cycle. Because in order to control the population, first we had to learn about them and where they can be found throughout the different parts of their lives. In other words, we had to know our enemy so that we could form the best attack plan. We'll start with the adult stage. Sea lampreys spawn during spring in the Great Lakes. After feeding on fish, adult sea lampreys move into streams. Males enter first, and then the females follow. Once a spawning ground has been found, males begin building nests, with help from the females after they arrive. How do you think an armless and legless sea lamprey can build a nest? Well, that suction cup mouth isn't just for feeding on fish. Sea lampreys also use their mouths to attach to rocks and move them around in streams. In fact, this rock-moving behavior gave sea lampreys their scientific name, Petromyzon marinus. Petromyzon means rock sucker or rock kisser, and marinus refers to their marine or oceanic origin. Once the nests are built, the sea lampreys spawn. Females release their eggs over the nest and the males fertilize them. Then the job of the adults is done. Sea lampreys only spawn once during their lives. They'll die within a few weeks after spawning. But thousands upon thousands of tiny eggs live on in the nest. In fact, each female can produce up to 100,000 eggs. After two weeks, the eggs hatch, and out pops a mob of teeny tiny larval sea lampreys. Each newborn larva is about the size of a pencil tip. The larvae you see here are already a few months old. Eventually, the larvae drift away from the nest and form burrows in the stream bottom, and that's where they'll live for the next three to ten or more years. At this stage, sea lampreys are essentially harmless. They do not have eyes, fins, or the parasitic mouth with all the teeth. Instead, larval sea lampreys have an oral hood, just a large opening, that they use to filter feed on microorganisms living in the water around them. Sea lamprey larvae grow slowly on this diet of tiny plants and animals. In fact, at the age of five, sea lamprey larvae are only about the size of a green bean. Can you imagine being five years old and the size of a green bean? That would make learning to ride a bike pretty tricky. However, even though these lamprey larvae are so tiny, they have now reached a critical part of their lives, and they're ready to undergo a metamorphosis. Can you name two other animals that also undergo a metamorphosis? You've got five seconds. Just like butterflies and frogs, sea lampreys also undergo a metamorphosis. But instead of developing beautiful wings or hopping legs, sea lampreys develop their eyes, fins, and unfortunately, their terrifying toothy mouths. The sea lampreys now look just like adults, only in miniature. Some people think the sea lampreys are cute at this stage. Cute as they may be, these sea lampreys are cold-blooded killers. Cold-blooded because they are a type of fish, which are cold-blooded organisms. And killers because even at this miniature stage, sea lampreys are lethal to fish. At this small but deadly stage, sea lamprey will leave the streams they were born in and migrate out into one of the five Great Lakes, where they will feed on fish for 12 to 18 months. Can you remember about how many pounds of fish a sea lamprey will kill during that time? Up to 40 pounds or 18 kilograms. At the expense of all those fish, the sea lampreys will finally reach their full grown size of 18 to 24 inches long. At this point, the sea lampreys begin looking for a stream that will be suitable for spawning. Though they may not look like discerning creatures, sea lampreys are actually quite picky. 
they don't just select any stream for spawning. Sea lampreys choose their spawning streams based on how those streams smell. If a sea lamprey can smell healthy, live, larval sea lampreys, or mature, ready-to-mate male sea lampreys, it will be more likely to choose that stream. Once in the stream, males and females find each other, build a horseshoe-shaped rock nest, spawn, and die. After the eggs hatch, the surviving larvae will go on to repeat the cycle. So how does this information help us control sea lamprey? To answer that question, I have a question for you. If it was your job to control sea lamprey, which life stage would you target? Would you go for the parasitic stage, living in a great lake, feeding on fish? Or might you choose the harmless larval stage, living at the bottom of a stream? I'll give you a moment to think. Do you have an answer? The Great Lakes Fishery Commission's control program targets every life stage except the parasitic stage because the Great Lakes are simply too large and too deep to specifically target parasitic sea lampreys in an economically feasible way. The newly metamorphosed downstream migrating stage is trapped in a few Great Lakes tributaries, though not much control effort is placed there either. The two stages that are the primary focus of the control program are the larval life stage and the spawning adult stage. And here to tell you more about the control program is my colleague, Jill. Thanks, Lauren. I'm Jill with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. My colleagues, Andrea, Ross, and Lauren, have told you the bad news about sea lampreys. I now have the pleasure of telling you the good news. The good news is that sea lampreys can be controlled. In fact, sea lampreys have the distinction of being one of the best controlled invasive species in the entire world. The control program is coordinated by the Great Lakes Fishery Commission in cooperation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The U.S. Geological Survey also partners with the Commission on scientific research to support the sea lamprey control program. Lauren mentioned that there are two life stages that are primarily targeted by the control program, the larval life stage and the adult life stage. So I'm going to talk with you a little bit about how we control sea lamprey populations at each of these life stages. Larval sea lampreys are controlled through the application of lamprecides. Lamprecides are selective chemical compounds that kill larval sea lamprey with little to no harm to fish or other wildlife populations. The selectivity to sea lampreys is critical. We would not have a successful control program if we killed many other organisms along the way. Ultimately, the goal of the sea lamprey control program is to maintain healthy populations of fishery species in the Great Lakes. Consequently, it's exceedingly critical that our control methods are selective to sea lampreys. The development of lamprecides took a lot of hard work and a little bit of luck by biologists in the 1950s at the Hammond Bay Biological Station in northeastern Michigan. These biologists tested 6,500 different chemicals at various concentrations, totaling about 20,000 trials. From all of that hard work, two chemicals were identified that are lethal to sea lampreys at specific concentrations without causing harm to other organisms. One of the two lamprecides discovered, called TFM, was chemical number 5,209 that was tested. Can you imagine? That means that essentially, these biologists failed 5,208 times before they succeeded. Talk about perseverance. And then they kept going, testing other things to see if there was something that may work better. So for any students that are watching, you've probably been told that you need to work really hard to be successful. You might have also heard from some wise people that failures are stepping stones to success. Well, both of those statements are absolutely true in the discovery of lamprecides. And those lamprecides change the future of the Great Lakes. Lamprecides are applied to about 100 Great Lakes tributaries on a regular basis. For the most part, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does the work in the United States, and Fisheries and Oceans does the control work in Canada. However, the agencies do partner together to treat larger systems. 
Lamprosites form the backbone of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission's control program, but lamprosites don't work alone to stop sea lampreys. The Commission also uses a network of barriers across the Great Lakes. These barriers block adult sea lampreys from accessing spawning areas and streams. Some fish, like salmon, can jump over low barriers, but being poor jumpers, Sea lamprey cannot jump over an obstacle more than about 18 inches high. So it doesn't have to be a very tall barrier, just about a foot and a half high, to block all of the spawning sea lampreys in a stream. There are just over 70 low head barriers across the Great Lakes that were purposely built to block sea lampreys, though some fish, like those jumping salmon I just mentioned, are still able to pass over the barrier and move upstream. The Commission also makes use of hundreds of existing structures that have been built throughout the past century or so for other purposes, such as old mill dams and hydroelectric dams. Even culverts at road crossings can function as sea lamprey barriers. Barriers are critical because they stop sea lampreys from infesting hundreds of miles of potential spawning habitat upstream of the barrier. Sea lampreys that are blocked by a barrier don't necessarily give up on spawning. However, they are forced to spawn in a much smaller area between the barrier and the lake that they came from. This small area can then be treated with lamprosides to control the sea lamprey larvae that are produced. So the purpose of barriers is twofold. First, they function to block sea lampreys from infesting habitat above the barrier, and secondly, barriers drastically reduce the cost of sea lamprey control by minimizing the area where lamprosides need to be applied routinely. A third control method currently in development is trapping. The Great Lakes Fishery Commission and its partners operate traps throughout the Great Lakes designed to capture adult sea lampreys, like the ones I have here in this tank, before they spawn. Most traps are stationed near barriers where there may be hundreds or even thousands of sea lampreys swimming around because they've been blocked from moving upstream. Yet, sea lamprey are curious, determined animals that commonly explore the region around barriers, looking for a way around, over, or through. Therefore, traps are strategically placed in locations around barriers where sea lampreys are most likely to go. Trapped sea lampreys are removed from the stream and most are taken to Hammond Bay Biological Station, which sure looks different from when the program first got started in the 1950s, where they are used for research on novel control methods, as well as education and outreach, like we're doing here today. As my colleague Ross said earlier, the current control program has reduced sea lamprey populations by 90% in most areas of the Great Lakes, which is a remarkable success considering where we started. But we are always looking for ways to do things better. Researchers at Hammond Bay Biological Station and many universities across the Great Lakes region support sea lamprey control by working to better understand the biology, ecology, and behavior of sea lampreys. Using this knowledge, the Commission is committed to enhancing existing and developing new control tactics and technologies. Many research projects focus on improving current control methods, such as testing portable seasonal barriers, designing new barriers that will allow for the passage of desirable species while blocking invasive species like sea lampreys, and discovering new lamprosides. Additional projects are focused on identifying ways to expand our ability to control other sea lamprey life stages, such as trapping the newly metamorphosed sea lampreys as they swim downstream toward the lake, in some cases using electricity to guide them into traps. Researchers are also exploring how we can turn the sea lamprey's keen sense of smell against them by manipulating the behavior of spawning adults in streams with attractant sense called pheromones and repellent scents called alarm cues. Just look at that reaction when a small amount of alarm cue made from deceased lampreys is poured into a tank. Researchers are even attempting to shut down the sea lamprey's sense of smell entirely by applying pheromone antagonists, which act like chemical nose plugs, 
and through genetic methods. Through funding innovative projects like these and other creative ideas, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission's control program works hard to stay one step ahead of the most notorious invasive species in the Great Lakes. Why does sea lamprey control matter to the Great Lakes? Without the discovery of the control methods that Jill described, life in the Great Lakes would be radically different. If sea lamprey were not brought under control, we would have very few large-bodied fish and dismal fisheries in the Great Lakes. Great Lakes fisheries are valued at over $7 billion annually. Without sea lamprey control, these multi-billion dollar fisheries would not exist. Have you ever caught a salmon, lake trout, walleye, or yellow perch while fishing on the Great Lakes? If you have, you caught that fish because of sea lamprey control. The sea lamprey control program is one of the best in the world for an invasive species. The integration of lamprecides, barriers, and traps has reduced the sea lamprey population by 90% across the entire Great Lakes region. That's a big deal for anyone who lives in the Great Lakes. So, the next time you catch a Great Lake salmon, or eat a whitefish dinner, or just feel good knowing that majestic fish like Lake Sturgeon still roam the depths of the Great Lakes, remember the critical role that sea lamprey control plays. Thanks for watching.